Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. All right, so today on the podcast, we've got Dr. Dave Schramm. Yes! Yes! Woo! Oh, we, have <laughs> we have been waiting for this moment, and it has finally arrived. Yeah, so what are some things we're going to talk about with Dave, Chris? All right, so we're going to talk about his background and passion, so you guys can get a chance to know somebody who we think is just an incredible individual. And we're going to talk about the marriage and family help landscape and what he thinks about it. You know, is there a bunch of garbage out there or is it most good? What's going on? Right. And then we're going to talk about how families and organizations can benefit from this field of knowledge. That's right. So, you know, just to give you an introduction to Dr. Dave Schramm, he is known as Dr. Dave on campus and across the country. So Dave Schramm is an associate professor and family life extension specialist at Utah State University in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. After graduating with his PhD from Auburn University, he worked as a professor at the University of Missouri for nine years. Since arriving at Utah State University in 2016, he has been appointed by Governor Herbert to serve on Utah's Commission on Marriage. He appears monthly on Fox 13's The Place, which I assume is a local uh, Fox affiliate there in, in Utah. And he launched a Facebook page, Dr. Dave USU, and we'll post links to that in the show notes, of course, where he shares research and tips on helping individuals, parents, and couples flourish. From British Columbia to Beijing, China, and from St. Louis to San Diego, Dr. Dave has given over 500 presentations, classes, and workshops to a variety of audiences. So you'll be sure to check out www.drdavespeaks.com, and I'll put a link to that, of course, in the show notes That's as well. That's Dr. Dave. Dr. D Dave Speaks. Dr. Dave Speaks. That's right. His work centers on promoting happy and healthy relationships, including romantic and marital relationships, parent-child relationships, co-parenting, and promoting flourishing individuals. Dr. Dave Schramm, thank you so much, and welcome to the Indigo Podcast. Yeah! Oh, oh Ben and Chris, I'm so excited for the next three hours. We're going to have so much fun. <laughs> you know, hey, don't challenge me. I'll go there. <laughs> it's on. Oh, All right. Is. Yes, absolutely. So, dude, let's start off with your background. Yeah. How how did you were born at a young age? Aren't yes. we all? Yeah, and, was, and, and, <laughs> uh, yeah, it all started way back when. No, so I I born and raised here in Utah. Um, Utah born and raised, and uh, went to college here. Went to BYU. Went to Utah State. Actually, where I'm at now, Utah State. So I got my master's degree here in human development, and family studies. And then I went to Auburn University, War Eagle, at uh, three years at Auburn for my PhD in in family studies. And then um, I took a job at the University of Missouri, as, as you mentioned. I was there for nine years as an extension specialist, as a family scholar, doing research on marriage, families, happiness. And I like to say this, I've never had a business class in my entire life. So you're like, wait a minute, why are we having this guy on, right? What's he going to tell us? So that's a little bit about my background and passion. Four years ago, I came to USU, and uh, man, I've just been traveling and speaking until COVID happened and now it's, it's all Zoom. And, um, but I'm, I'm out there trying to really help couples, families, parents have happy, healthy relationships. And then recently I'm thinking, man, this is stuff we've got to have in the business, in the workplace, in the corporate world, because it's about relationships and I am a relationship, uh, yeah, scientist. So that's a little bit about my my background and passion. I love helping family. I love helping businesses learn these family uh, skills and principles that they can apply in the workplace. Yeah. That's so awesome. why why therapy? Like so you know like you know you start off playing bikes and baseball as a kid, right? And yeah. then so slowly you evolve. What what attracted you, or how did you? What was your winding path to where you are now? Yeah, that's a good. You know, I grew up playing sports, and I just wanted. to, Well, first, everyone wants to be a professional athlete. Ah, dang it, that didn't work. <laughs> 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 so I went to Plan B. Plan B. I want to go into you know sports medicine. I want to stay involved in sports somehow. But then I, I got more realistic, and I thought, ah, you know, I, I have an amazing family. I have four older sisters. I have a younger brother. I have a parents who have an amazing marriage. And so I thought, you know what, I want to help people have what I had because I realized, oh, man, 
the most people are not like my family. There's a lot of unhappiness out there. There's a lot of grief. There's violence and abuse and all this horrific stuff. And so I said, you know what? The rest of my life, I want to help people be happy like like I was happy. Uh, I had an amazing family. And so that's that's really my my why is I want to help people have the happiness that I had. Uh, and I've got an amazing marriage. I've got f- uh, four kiddos, three teenage daughters, three teenage daughters. Oh, well, your yes. house smells amazing, doesn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> that's why the door's <laughs> locked right here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's a little bit of background. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's it's interesting, too, because just looking at you know your background and your CV, which is, you know, a fancy word for resume that we use in academia, um, you know, you're a legit scholar in this area too. You've done a lot, you've gotten a lot of grant funding for your research and for your work in the, these areas. And then, uh, you know, you're also doing this, uh, work that is a little bit more, uh, how should I say more, I guess, mainstream focused, um, with your speaking and, and so forth. Um, I mean, what are you trying to accomplish in this world? Yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to take the, the best of the best research. And so I, I look at scholars in positive psychology, right? Sean Acor and those who are doing so much work on positivity, happiness, flourishing. I, I kind of couple it with the best out there, you know, John Gottman and his research on marriage I love and families. Do you those of pre- you that don't know about the Gottman Institute, you need to yeah. go Google it. You need to get their seven principles book. Anything that comes out by them, you need to be following. Sorry, I just had to interject. Yeah, this is really one of the do. few evidence-based hope sticks that are out there for people in relationships. Sorry, Dave. Keep, no, keep going. man, I'm glad you made that plug because I, if you if you didn't, I was because the Gottmans are amazing. I, the opportunity, John and Julie, they actually came into to Salt Lake um, last year, went and saw them. So mm. I, I love taking their stuff and the best of the parenting research, and I love to combine it. And so my my mission as a as a professor, and, and some people don't know, what, what's, what's extension? What do you do with extension? Mm. Extension really means... I get to take the research, I develop programs, and literally extend it out to Utahns and and across the nation. So I I, I make it real. I take the research that no one's going to read in the Journal of Marriage and Family or Family Relations, except for (laughs) grad grad students, because I make my grad students read it, so that's the only ones who are reading it. And I take those nuggets and I say, okay, how do we get this out to real people who can use it? And that, that's where I came in with extension. So I, I translate really research into practice. That's that's my job. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and, you know, it's it's I think it's just so fundamental to life happiness, you know, how we how we grow up. And so our the parents who, who raise us, uh, you know, how we get along with our siblings. And then once we try to do it ourselves, once you have kids, I mean, if, if you don't have children, so all, all three of us do have children and, you know, it. That is, it, it's not for sissies. It just isn't. Yeah, it's hard. I just want to, first of all, if you're one of those jack wagons out there that said, you know, kids change everything. You know what? Yeah, I want to sue you for false advertising. <laughs> it needs to be more like, welcome to baby nom. <laughs> Here's your MRE. <laughs> Life is never the same, my friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's a lot of work. It is. Yeah. When we had four kids, uh, or, you know, eight, six, four, and two, oh. you're like, oh man, you know, this is, you're in the trenches. This is a lot of work that, in fact, the, the toughest thing a human being will ever do in their life is raise another miniature little person in their lives. <laughs> it's, it's not for the, the, the weak of heart, right? Man, it's, it's tough. So it's a lot of work. Um, and, and so are relationships. Uh, but man, it's so rewarding. It's some of the most rewarding thing I've ever done is to help people in their in their families. Yeah. So Dave, you're not you don't have Dave's secretly defined. You were on a camping trip. Maybe you ate an odd substance that you found growing <laughs> along the way, and now you've you're come down with the secret truth of relationships. That's not what you're doing at all, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. You know, I, I I'm taking the the best of the best. I've done my own research, right? Yeah, like twenty yeah. million dollars in grants, and I'm studying happiness, and I'm I'm taking it out there to to people. But there there is, I mean, this the secret sauce that I talked about in my in my TEDx talk. It, it really stems from, um, and so it's a it's the shortest study I've ever done, guys. And it was two, it was two questions. And the first question was. If I die tomorrow, what I'd miss the very most would be, and I, I asked people just fill in the blank, one or two words, you know, what would it be? Wow. And then the second question was, to me, life is all about, and then fill in the blank. Again, just one or two words. 
And as I started analyzing these answers from over 2,000 people all across the United States, it, overwhelmingly, 86% said it's about family relationships wow. to me. You know, the one thing that they would miss most, and, and you know what's even more telling? Guess what they didn't say? Hmm. Less than 2% said anything about work or money. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not what life is about. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, work can be meaningful and engaging, enjoyable. You, know, you guys love what you do. I love what I do. Yeah, money is pretty sweet when you have it. It is. <laughs> when, you have, when, you, when you don't have it. It's, yeah, it's, it really stinks, worst. right? Yeah, it's yeah. the worst. But, but that was really kind of that pivotal point that I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm in a business where that I help people with the thing that is most important to them, and that's their their relationships. And so that, that's what's rewarding. That's, again, why I do what I do is that short little study, two questions, and it, it's people. People matter more than anything else. Yeah. yeah, I think that's what distinguishes you. You are actually doing research. Most people that go to see a therapist or something, that somebody got, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Dr. Day, but, you know, they went through the training and now they're just practicing. Right. Um, and most of them probably, you know, you know, they took some statistics, probably undergrad, but they really don't have that. I mean, because you can understand scientific literature more if you've gone at least through one peer reviewed iteration. Right. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that whole process of of learning and publishing and then getting it back and rewriting and taking it all in. So I'm, I'm a big fan of research based. You'll hear me, you know, evidence based or research based practices because there is there's just a lot there's just so much stuff out there do this or say this or do that and you'll be happy it's it's not quite that easy yeah yeah like at the so let's talk let's just shift over to the marriage and family help landscape right and, and kind of you know if the sex advice and cosmo and glamour magazine got it right <laughs> there'd be all these therapists out of business and <laughs> <laughs> and to your point, it's like, no, any it, it sells. It's easy to go on the web, set up a website, and I, I have the secret sauce for making relationships work. And whereas Ben and I, and it sounds like you definitely resonate with this, we're more like, hey, let's start with the best practice, and maybe we stand a little bit on the shoulders of giants and see a little bit further and maybe into an emerging area of practice, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the foundation has to be researched. It's got to be... I uh, got to have some background. You got to build on these. If you're not even aware of these, some of these giants in these fields, that that's the place to start. And, and too many people, yeah, they just like to spout out something that, that's catchy. They don't have the background, or maybe I'm just going to read hurry in this in this popular book, or heaven forbid, this this magazine, and then and spit out some tips about um, about happiness or marriage or workplace culture, or all all those things. So, big fan. Oh man, yeah, we're speaking the same language when it comes to to research backed happy hacks. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's just interesting, as you were saying all that, I was just reflecting on, you know, some of the the practical work that my wife and I have done. So we were, uh, you know, we, we do this little thing through our church where we try to talk with some couples that are getting ready to get married and so forth. And they go through a program, it's called Prepare and Enrich, which they, they do this whole thing where they, they take some assessments, which in my estimation as an industrial and organizational psychologist are actually pretty decent. And they, uh, and we talk with them about a lot of things about communication. It's just, we have, you know, we're not therapists, but we talk with them about communication. We talk with them about family of origin and how that can influence things. Um, you know, I guess if, if you came across some people and said, hey, you know, they, they tell you, Dave, we just got engaged. Are there any things that you would tell them or uh, advise them to be thinking about? Let's say they're, we're getting married about a year. What do you what do you think? Yeah. Oh, and a year. That, that's actually the first spot right there, Ben, is to get to know each other. And I'm a big fan of getting to know each other through through all of the seasons. You know what I mean? Just mm. because anyone can kind of fake it for a minute. In fact, all relationships, when they first start out, oh, man, we're smelling good. We're looking good. Yeah, we don't burp <laughs> or do any of those other things in front of the other person. We're hiding a lot, right? Oh, to be 20 that. again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you kind of fake each other into this into this relationship at first. And then you get going and you build that relationship of, of trust first. And so you start to close, you know, disclosing a little bit. You talk about family background. You start to ease in, oh, where are you from and how many sisters? And tell me about your, your, your parents. And so you get to know each other. But that's kind of the superficial stuff. In fact, most mm. of the stuff, superficial is still good. You build on the superficial. And then you get up into the personal level of communication and then the validating. And that's kind of where we open up and you feel a little bit more vulnerable. 
because there's some trust there. But but you're talking about important things, your values, um, really the, that Gottman has found that a lot of it is founded on friendship. It's amazing. He comes back to that. It's, it's about kindness. It's about gratitude and respect and forgiveness and compassion and positivity. And he has these number of these, you know, being able to get along and to manage conflict, of course, right? He talks about that, um, the criticism and contempt and defensiveness, snowballing, those things that get in the way. And that's how things are, are broken down. But yeah, the, the stuff that we have looked at, in fact, we've just come out with this new relationship model where we've looked at the best of the best and say, yeah, there are some things that, that happy couples are, are doing. And it's often little, it's not these big grand vacations. It is uh, what Gottman said, it's turning toward bids for connection, right? Mm. Your sweet is like, hey, oh, you'll never believe the car I saw today. Oh, man, you know, you're always looking at a car. There's no way we can. Have... But no, when people can actually validate and be like, oh, what was it? And then you have that conversation. So it's about respect and turning toward those those little bids for for connection you guys are probably familiar with that stuff yeah, yeah. so the, the bid thing well let me say this first off and um so a priest once told me because some friends of mine got married in the orthodox church and they they the priest kept missing their premarital counseling appointment <laughs> so and then oh, they said no. hey wait we get we're now getting married in six months we've been missing each other for like half a year now what it's like well you know what you'll be fine besides you guys come to me and nobody ever listens. You got to wait until it's a dumpster fire of a relationship to do anything. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, yeah. so can people actually improve their chances for success as they're in that road to matrimony? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, they can do things. They can they can actually avoid things as well. Uh, one of the things that, that I see a lot is um, kind of the little secrets, whether I've got my secret stash of money or my secret credit card. The slush I, fund. Yeah, this and that slush fund, you know, it, it's a little <laughs> that we have, but it's, it starts to be like, okay, you know, I'm talking behind your back to others. And, and here's this little, we're kind of living these little secret separate lives. Uh, and I'm not a fan of that. Being on the same page, we share things we're open with each other that has to be the, the foundation of trust and loyalty fidelity just fierce fidelity i'm a big, a big fan of so no flirting doing those other little things but yeah turn toward be there for each other that in, in my mind and the research shows is the the foundation yeah wow. so the back to the bid thing since i had to do that non sequitur um one of the things, so like my wife, Em and I were really good at this. Like we would talk all the time about all kinds of intellectual stuff we were exploring and, and we were really growing. We met in, each other in college and that developed into a relationship. She was like the Greek teacher's pet in theology school, right? So like she had all the nerdy traits I was looking for. And, but once kids hit, hit the fan, so to speak, <laughs> we... You know, I would, my bids were always, hey, look at this really cool article. And we used to really connect on that stuff. And she was like, yeah, I don't have time for that. And it just, my bids for reaching out kept getting shut down. And then that started leading to like, what am I, just a sperm doning paycheck over here? What? <laughs> well, I, I have no relationship. <laughs> but it wasn't until we finally, and this is the thing, we saw like six different therapists. Some of them were 400 bucks an hour that had all the credentials. Like, you know, I'd send it out to our therapy, you know, buddies, like, here's people in my area, pick five or six that I can. And they were horrible. And it wasn't until we got to somebody that actually only had her master's in social work only had but she had done a lot of work in inner city stuff and she was a meek and mild woman but when she spoke she had authority mm -hmm. you know you could just tell because mm -hmm. she had been in like violent home situations and like zinned it on out but she turned us on to people like Gottman another one was Schnark um Passionate Marriage was another good book and and this is when the the key started turning for us right yeah, wow. yeah. And, and you know what? People have said even marriage therapy can be hazardous for your health, actually, because if it's you don't find the right one or the right fit, it can it can do more damage than good. So I'm, I'm a wow. big fan of, yeah, kind of Gottman based or attachment based Sue Johnson with mm. her, her attachment and connection. Um, big, big fan of those. And so be very, very picky yeah, listeners and, and others about who you see. If you don't feel like it's a good fit and, and relating right off the bat, and they're not in your corner to, to, you know, hey, let's work on this. 
keep shopping keep shopping yeah, yeah I would, some people are like, well, maybe you guys need to explore divorce. And we're like, whoa, wait a minute. We're paying you to help us keep it together. <laughs> yeah. What is going on here? <laughs> Everyone's telling us to do that. I don't need you to be telling me that. Right. Oh, yeah, man. yeah. You know, so in, in my area of, of research and so forth, when we talk about things like leadership, we oftentimes you know talk about, is this something that is uh, you're born with or is it something that you can be made into um, through you know, different behaviors and practices and so forth. And I guess one thing I'm wondering is, you know, applying that to the relationship landscape, um, you know, are there things that maybe are somewhat trait based or inherent in, in someone's DNA, perhaps that, that makes them a little bit better at relationships? Um, maybe what percentages of it is kind of that versus, you know, things I need to learn and work at? Um, do you have any sense for what the literature tells us there? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question, Ben. So uh, I'll, and I'll lean a little bit on some of the, the psychology and happiness and, and uh, well-being research that we know about 50% of our happiness, well, I'll start with happiness, then go into relationship stuff. About half of our happiness is inherited. It's from our parents. It's about 50% on average. And then about 10% is um, our outside, right? It's our it's our car, it's our job, it's even our, our spouse or partner. It's all the other stuff. Only accounts for about 10%, your paycheck, job, all that stuff. And so that leaves 40%. 40% is up to us. So 40% is our thoughts, it's our behaviors, our actions, those things that we get to choose to do. And, and now you mesh some of that then with, with some of the personality. I'm a, I'm a big um, personality guy as well. I think it's important. I, I like the color code personality. I don't know if you guys have, have taken that with the red, yellow, mm. uh, white, and blue. But for now, that, now, you'll have to go into that because the minute you say personality, my spidey sense goes, non-evidence space not yeah. evidence. so yeah. like we love the big five over here so tell us about this color thing yeah so the color code person and, and it's it, you know it can give you some guidance and some help but for me it was a big it was kind of a game changer for me so when when uh, i took that and my wife and our kids took it we thought wow we're we're very different in how we we manage things and so the red is kind of more power and and leader and take charge and get things done blue is more about intimacy and personal and relationships and warm fuzzies uh, white is more about uh, the peacemaker right and everything's fine oh it's fine you know you spill the milk or hey, hey it's okay it's going to be okay uh, so no no arguments there and then the yellow is the fun kind of the fun the playmaker that that person and so it was really helpful because i'm 20 white and 20 blue and zero red my wife is red and so i think yeah she's the leader she likes to take uh you know here let's take this charge and she makes plans and i and i'm like hey, she that's plans great. the vacations doesn't she that is that is <laughs> and the, check, the checkbook and everything else just says yeah you do you you do your thing because those are our strengths i'm a, I'm a big fan of martin seligman that's very you know positive mm -hmm. psychology um leader in that authentic happiness one of my all-time favorite books and he talks about we're each born with some strengths and i think um one of the first things that you should do with anyone Assess your strengths, via character.org or authentic happiness.org. Take that little assessment, understand your five signature strengths, and even your family members, you know, my spouse or my kids, to find out what are their strengths and use those, use those strengths. And so I'm a big fan of kind of understanding your personality, understanding your values, your strengths. And then, Ben, I think that you can exercise coming back to that. You can, you can exercise, you can learn things to be more um, self-aware, right, of situations to say, okay, yeah, I needed to, to respond to that and said, I need to get off my phone. I need to maybe text her during the day. Maybe, you know, what is her love language coming to some Gary Chapman stuff to say, how do they prefer to receive love? So it's really a, a combination of, of things, but I, yeah, we are born with some things. Um, and then I think, you know, my parents, for example, I never heard, I'm one of those, those weirdos that I never heard my dad raise his voice at my mom ever. And so they have this this amazing marriage. And so I'm a little bit more quiet and patient with the kids and, and reserved. And I'm about relationships and peace and harmony. So some of it is. It's inherited. It's, a, it's our environment. But it's things that we can learn. And it's this crazy combination of, of read from the best books. I'm a big fan of that. Research-based books. But then get a, an understanding of, of ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Well, and I just that think it's so interesting to think about, you know, how different other people are from you. Mm. And it's a very common assumption that we think everybody is just like us. And it's just not the case. Right. And uh, you that's know, why you, aliens we, are human looking. 
right? Because yeah. they surely <laughs> got to be like us. <laughs> of course they are. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the, the love languages thing. And, um, you know, my wife is uh, definitely in the acts of service camp, you know. So, you know, you, you've got to do things uh, to show your love for my wife. You know, I, I, think, uh, I think it's very important to understand that other people are different and appreciating that and responding accordingly, right? Yeah, man, I actually think you've hit one of the, the most important findings to date, and that is the ability to have compassion and see things from another person's perspective, like fully see that from their shoes, whether it's your, your kid's shoes, your boss's shoes, your coworkers, that ability to get outside of ourselves uh, for some people is very, very hard. It's just one way, it's my way, and I can't understand what were you thinking, my child. And so I'll, even in some parenting workshops, I'll actually have them say, okay, now before you get mad at your child for whatever they just did, you've got to come up with five reasons why they should have done the thing, right? So like, they, they hit my sister. Okay, come up with five reasons why Ben should have hit right his sister mm -hmm. Jenny there. And they're like, what? What? That's, I know it's Mom, I hear right. what you're saying, I, but she deserved right. it. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> I heard your five reasons, and I yeah. still think she needed still, a pop. It. <laughs> yeah, it's about, the whole point is like slowing down, get inside someone else's shoes, see the world from their eyes. That that is that's a massive, um, I think, understated a principle that we don't talk about as much. Yeah, yeah, because it can change us. Do you think some people are incapable of doing that? I'm thinking of like super narcissistic people. Maybe if they're actually clinically narcissistic. Yeah. Yeah. They just, they just don't have that ability. Yeah. I, I don't understand why that I'll never understand that you're an idiot. Yeah. They just, they can't, they can't go there. Yeah. 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 So the, the two things I want to say here is one, I like that you acknowledge that 50% is just inherited because so many people think that like, Oh, look, cure marital problems with Windex and these three easy tricks. <laughs> that's, that's not how it happens. It's a complex intersectional Gordian knot that you got to untie. Second thing, I loved how you use the personality stuff, right? Personality is not so much about assessing somebody else's fitness for life or something. You know, like a lot of organizations try to say, well, what makes the perfect fighter pilot? Is it a meek and mild person or a brat? And, they, you know, they spent a lot of money trying to assess that. They found like, man, all kinds of personalities can be a good fighter pilot. All kinds of good personalities can be a good partner. But when you have that lexicon i'll use which is this is a lang a common set of terms and a way to frame the conversations something say hey you know that's just my red flashing up you mm -hmm. know yeah. i might you now you have these heuristics these shortcuts to have higher quality conversations about how you're starting to see what's going on same thing where like if my wife doesn't have attention for me i'm like ow i've had like four bids today that you've totally ignored and she knows like oh wait a minute Oh, shoot, those were bids you were trying to give for my attention. And I know that if I don't pay attention to enough of those bids, you're going to hate my guts. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Hey, you, know, you know, guys, I want to bring up this, this, this principle as well. This was a game changer for me. And that is when I discovered, um, you know, Rick Hansen, he talks about the three needs that we have. And I'm a big fan of these. We each have the need for safety. We're born into this world with say, emotional and physical safety, satisfaction, to do things that are fun and enjoyable and, and improve and grow and, and enjoy life and then connection. And those are the big three when we have safety, satisfaction and connection at home and in the workplace. Those are some of the keys. And I, and I come back a lot of what I talk about are meeting those those three needs. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, you know, so I guess one thing I'm wondering is how this all plays into careers and work life and, and all of those types of issues. And, you know, there's some people that say, yeah, you can, you can manage, you know, this work-life balance type of idea. Um, and there's a lot of research on that. And then there's also um, the idea that, you know, it, it's always a trade-off and every moment that you spend on one, you're not spending on another. How do you think about work-life balance and balancing careers with family and marriage? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good a good question, a good topic because I mean, let me let me start a little history lesson first off. This this whole idea is actually relatively new, Ben, as you're aware. You know, before the the industrial revolution, work and family, that was all, you know, it was like 8 hours were asleep and 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 it's now the rest of the time we're with family but we're working together. So historically, work and family time, it, it's all been one. It's all been really the, the, the same thing. And so it wasn't really until yeah, industrial revolution, 1890s, and the 1900s, oh, 
now a person, often back then it was the, the father, he would leave home and then come come back into home. And so it, it is, it's relatively uh, new, even this concept of, of work family balance. And so I, for me, you know, I, I try to, and I have actually, it's a little bit different for me, right, guys, because I read and study marriage and family for, for my job, and then I come home and I, let, and I get to practice it on my, on my kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, test wow. you guys out a little, yeah, poke them, prod them a little bit, <laughs> test them, and, and try all that out. But really, it, it re- really is. I think that there is this, this trade-off, and we can, who we are should be who we are at work as far as our personalities. It should mesh. In fact, employers would do best if they did some of these assessments and say, hey, you know, these are my strengths. How can we best use your strengths uh, at work? And then I feel like I'm not even at work because I love what I do at work. I love what I do at home. And there isn't this big switch off. Okay, now I've got to change my mindset. Now I now I'm at home. Because who you are is regardless of where you are, that that is who you are. I don't I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it does. And, uh, cause if you're, if you're trying to fake things, it, it becomes exhausting. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that can make it a lot harder to kind of switch those different roles. Um, you know, it, it also, it, it's hard for me, just a personal, uh, struggle that I always have is, uh, you know, and you, you get this cause you, you've got a bunch of kids too. It can be very loud in our house. Right. So there's a lot of noise. If I travel for a while, which I haven't been doing much recently because of COVID, but if I travel for something and, I, and then I come back, um, I've been very used to the quiet and it's like, oh God, my damn, what's yeah, going on here? Like wow. you know? <laughs> and, um, so, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely hard though. I think just to, um, to manage those different roles that we all have. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can be, it can be very, yeah. uh, especially as the stress increases at work, then you tend to, that tends to spill over at home. And those three areas, again, I call it the, the pleasant life, that's asleep, the personal life, and the professional life, those three Ps. But they all affect each other. If I don't sleep well, I'm crankier to my kids. You know, I'm not as productive at, at work. If I'm cranky at work, it comes over, it spills over into my kids. Maybe I don't sleep well. So those three areas really do. They overlap. They, they affect each other. But if I am not be able to kind of shut it off and be like, okay, you know, I'm I'm home now. And even, even as a grad student, I remember at, at Auburn University, I would come home and I had all kinds of, of papers and stuff. I, I had three daughters in grad school, right? What was I wow. thinking? And that was tough. But I made Yeah, what point. were you thinking, yeah, Dave? What was I thinking? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so I don't recommend this to those out there going through that. That was like, yeah, swimming with three kids on your back. It was really tough. But I would come home and be with my family. And I would say, hey, this is I'm not going to get these years back. And so I'm with you, I'm with you. And then I would put them to bed. And I remember some nights I would go and snuggle with my wife, put her to bed, and then I'm boom. And I am doing my homework till 2 or 3 a.m. And, and that was rough. Right? I, couldn't, I couldn't have sustained that. But for me, yeah, family, I didn't want to miss out on that family time. And so I shut it off. I was home with my kids, rolling around, having fun, put them to bed, have some time with my wife. And then, yeah, then went to work. So, yeah. And I think organizations really need to pay attention to this. I know like Ben and I met each other in Afghanistan on a deployment, actually. And that was huh. kind of what kicked off. You know, we we're both doing similar work parallel and we had fun doing gigs. We made it official, whatever. Right. We, we got business married. So um, <laughs> the but when we have soldiers that are having a hard time with their spousal relationship or with their family, that really affects their performance on the deployment, right? And and it also affects people's uh, work stuff. What is, what are some of the stuff that you see in that space? Yeah. Oh man, uh, that that stress and that spillover, call it that spillover effect, right? If things are not going well um, in your relationship, it does. A spill, whether you're in the military or wherever you go, you get to work and your focus, your attention is on that fight. You know, are those things I should have said, or now I feel bad for that. And so that that loss, it accounts for about thirty three point three billion is lost every year just from uh, relationship stress that spills over into mm. the workplace. And so what happens is that we, our our brains we're wired. There's about eleven million pieces of information that are coming at us, and that a lot every second, every second. Most of it is is uh, filtered through our subconscious, but we can only focus on about forty bits. We call that attention, but only about forty bits of information every second. 
And so what happens is that, that we are born with this negativity bias where we're wired to focus on negativity. So we're born with five times as many brain cells that are wired for negativity for every one that's wired for positivity and opportunity. So already the, the stress, what what's, we're presented with, it's going to swamp us. And when we're thinking about the stress, I'm not noticing my three-year-old that says, dad, dad, you know, come play, come play with me and tugging at my knee. I'm like, Hey, not right now. Okay. I told you and we're a little bit more gruff. So it's the same thing, that fire, that, that emergency, that red light of, Oh, at work and I'm stressed out. And it's more of that fear based. And, and you know what, coming back to this, this whole emotion thing, most of our, our emotions, they're, they're felt in the present, but they're anchored often in the past or in the future, right? Stress and worry and fear. It's always about the future and um, anger and resentment and all that is is sadness. Even it's all about something that's happened in the past. And so if our 40 bits are either in the future, if we set up camp right in the future or in the past, but we're not there in the present in our relationships or at work. And so being present, being available, mindfulness is this huge buzzword, right? Being mindful of who you're with, what you're doing. And so when you're at work, be, be at work 100%. And give that, you guys have heard the concept of flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Of Mihai. course, yeah, yeah love it. Get, hey, good good job that. good job on the, the pronunciation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know someone's a scholar, right, man? If they, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. <laughs> so that, that concept, a big fan of that as well, of losing yourself, um, whether you're at home with your kids, losing yourself at work, you get into this, this state of flow, but but be there and and. You just be leery of though, okay, where's my attention right now? Is it, am I stewing? Because about 85% of the stuff we worry about never happens anyway. Yeah. 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 So one thing I'm wondering about, uh, and this, this was a topic that I remember, you know, some pundits talking about and, and so forth early on in the, the days of being quarantined and so forth, people were saying, you know, we're going to probably have uh, increased domestic violence and other types of issues, um, you know, and it is hard to stay sane, obviously, for all of us, if we are maybe doing less traveling and that kind of dynamic that occurs. Uh, you know, what are, what are your thoughts around, you know, staying sane during um, these different times, I'll say, because, you know, some kids are starting to go back to school, some aren't. Um, what do you think that implies for families and relationships? Yeah, that's a, a huge topic right now, right? The mental health yeah. and being, and it comes back to, in my mind, the, the three needs, safety, satisfaction, and connection. Because, and even that word, you guys are probably uh, aware of this, just the social distance. Man, I was, social scientists are like, no, that we hate that word. Yeah, no, yeah. it's physical distancing, right. that, that whole argument. Because we need that, that social connection. And so what is often happening with the, the quarantine, for example, everyone is concerned about which one of those needs is right now is safety. That was the immediate one is safety. Keep everyone home and mask and all this. We get so overwhelmed with that. We, we had to stay home. We couldn't go on our, all these trips were canceled and kids can, can't see their friends. So the satisfaction is gone and connection. We can't go out with and see anybody. So that's, that's the reason those three needs were under fire all three at the same time and very little time in history are all three human needs uh, being pressured at the same time. So that's what led to this explosion. And I, I can't do this anymore. And I can't work from home anymore. Yeah. I, there's no separation in any of that. So they can't, what we can do, we can slow down and learn to live and appreciate the moment. We can be grateful for what we do have. It's, it's positive, uh, that upward spiral. I don't know if you've uh, read that book, The Upward Spiral by Alex mm-hmm. Korb, one of my all-time uh, favorite books. But he talks about these little hacks. They're all science-backed, research-based things that you can do um, from gratitude to like to massage, to kindness, to even simply smiling, which, which we can't see now because people have their mask, you know? So that whole thing <laughs> when I say, yeah, you need to smile more, but, but those are the things, the little things we can write letters. You know what our girls did? They said, well, what can we do? And they love writing their friends who are in Missouri from where we moved from. They started getting letters. Yeah. Actual, hmm. do you remember letters guys? Yeah. Back then. <laughs> they actually started writing letters and doing little creative projects around the house. They started making funny videos of themselves sending. So they found ways to connect, to stay satisfied and and to stay safe. Right. I think that's awesome. So I, we got a great landscape of how you got here, man, awesome survey of kind of the landscape of what we can do with some of this knowledge. Now let's, let's focus to something that you're doing that's a little outside your typical researcher, um, practitioner, extension functionary, as it were. Um, 
let's talk about organizations, right? We kind of led there with that last, you know, kind of question, but like how families and organizations, well, I will just say, let's shift to how can organizations benefit from this seemingly unrelated field of knowledge, which is this whole like family relationship kind of stuff. And and that's where you're focusing a little bit, right? With some of your Dr. Dave speaks, right? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of that. So I went out and actually um, looked at Inc.com. Are you familiar with that? And they, mm-hmm. each year now for the last several years, they put out this, uh, the survey of the top workplaces. And so they survey and over 130,000, I think in 2019, employees took this and it came back. And um, they said, all right, what makes a great workplace? And that's what I studied. That's really when I got into it. And I started analyzing their responses. They get 100 words. All they get is 100 words to describe why we think we're a great place to work. I started analyzing those and I found out, oh my goodness, the top 15 words, they're saying things like culture and team. And they actually go right into those those three needs of safety, satisfaction, and connection. It was funny, the, the ninth most frequently used word they said was family. And that's mm. really when it hit me because they talk about people and fun and perks and all of these things that they're doing. These workplaces feel like family. In fact, they use that word quite a bit. And all these billboards, I drive down I-15 here and I see, yeah, welcome to the family and, and home loans that feel like family. There's one that says, think family. I think, wow, these savvy businesses, they've really caught on. They know, coming back to my first um, survey, what matters most to their employee? It's not their job. It's their family. And so when they treat them like family at work and they're interested and take care of them and give them family time and and make things family friendly, then, oh, yeah, those employees will gladly give their very best on the job. And so they can do things like gratitude that the bosses, um, I know CEOs who will send personalized text messages on their one month mark at their one year mark. They have a reminder that comes up and says, oh, Andy's been here one year. And hey, thanks so much for what you're doing, you know, driving forklift out in the warehouse or whatever it is. They are grateful. They're grateful for them. And that's a hallmark of a strong family is, is gratitude, communication. They say, hey, give me feedback as a boss or a CEO. I, I'm open to it. Um, I had a dean, for example, at Missouri that took the uh, the faculty out, just two or three of us out to eat uh, occasionally and just say, hey, give me some feedback. What do you, what's going well? What would you like to see different? And so he's very open. He's humble to, to the feedback. Same with strong families. They do that. And so it was play and celebration, strong families. They do fun things together, vacations and fun things, strong workplaces. They learn from the families. They're doing fun things together. They're making that environment. Uh, they have celebrations. They recognize employees. They help them to feel valued and cared for and appreciated and recognized. All of these things add up. So it's not one thing, just like in family. It's, it's not one thing. It's many little things that they're doing consistently. And it, yeah, it really starts at the, at the top. They set that example. And from the top down, they spill over of that, that positivity and it's sincere. It's not like, okay, we're going to have a nerf dart, you know, war. That's not going to change anything if there's no trust and, you know, backbiting, all this stuff that, that's happening. So so those are some a few little things that people can do in the workplace to make it feel feel like family. Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes I've come across executives who are like, you know, I don't really think our culture is that great. Uh, we need to make our culture better. And what do you think about maybe like a foosball table, right? Or, or they'll just have like some sort of one thing that they think they can do. And I'm like, yeah, there's a, you're, you're right. I've talked to your folks. I've done maybe some <laughs> assessment. Your culture stinks. Uh, you do need to do something, uh, but there's not just one thing. And guess what? The first place it needs to start is with you going and looking in the mirror. But then the, the, the keg and foosball table are way cheaper than changing our culture. <laughs> yeah, a lot easier. A lot well, easier. That's, work, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, so, but I think you bring up a, a great point, Dave, that, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of little things. And, if you're approaching that as an executive with the mindset of, oh, I just need to, I need, oh, culture. I, yeah, um, that's on my to-do list. I need to work on that. Um, all right, what's a couple things, you know, a few things that I can do here to, to change that? That That's just manipulation, right? Yeah. Um, it, it has, you can't fake it. Yeah, yeah, you can't fake it. You can't just put a little Band-Aid or have a little celebration and, okay, everything's better now. It really starts with, uh, right at the top, a little self-assessment. How am I? How am I approaching? Am I smiling? Am I recognizing? Am I going? Do I know people's names? You know, what am, what am I doing 
to contribute to this to this culture. And it, it does. It starts with with number one and the managers and that that feeling um, that they get. And it really, I, I say again, it comes with the strengths. Assess everybody's strengths. Find out what they're good at. Then celebrate those in the, in the little you know meetings we have. Hey, let's let's talk about. You start every meeting. Every meeting start with the good news minute. I do that in my faculty meeting. I do it in my classrooms to say, all right, good news minute. Let's celebrate. Let's talk about the good. What good things are going on in your lives? It doesn't even have to do with work or school. Just tell me about the good. So you start out on this positive. You're priming their brains basically for positivity and happiness. And then I know others that say, all right, we're going to do text two before 10. I want you to text two people before 10 a.m. Just a little, whether it's a little positivity, it's it's say, hey, a sincere gratitude, or say, hey, we need to do lunch sometime, or hey, thanks, mom, you know. You just text two people. It's these little things that get them thinking outside of themselves. That's that in fact my eight words, you guys, for resilience and happiness at home and in the workplace are search inward, turn outward, look upward, and press forward. And and those those eight words, and I kind of go into those when I do other trainings. Assess your strengths, turn outward. Happy cultures are not about me. It's about turning outward and doing little things. How can I help this person? What This team now that we're on, we can celebrate, do positive things. Look upward is about hope and optimism and pressing forward through the challenges. We're going to go through down times, but it's persevering through through some of those. So those are, those are eight words that I found in strong families and strong workplaces. Yeah, so when some of these guys, well, Imagine this, you turn to your wife and say, hey, honey, you know, you, you've been, I see these bids and you've been doing asks on, you know, maybe being involved with the kids more, cleaning up around the house more, whatever it is. I, so I just, I wrote them all down. What's the minimum I can get away with and still stay married and, and maybe get lucky on a Friday night? You know what? Where's that? And, but I, that's exactly what I see organizations do all the flipping time. And I just, just makes me so mad, you know? What it, all right, guys, um, how many jokes do I need to tell in a week? And do we need to have one team building a quarter? Will that be enough for you? Yeah. It's the same thing. And you're not going to get there because that's faking it. it Everybody is. knows like this jack wagon doesn't care about me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm missing the boat. Yeah. You can really do two be behavior. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Arbinger Institute. Read, read yes. their stuff. It's so good. You can do things in two ways. Right. You can do things in the uh, two behaviors. You can say, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. But really, one is is the sincere and with real intent. And the other one is, is not, it's just a bandaid. I'm just saying it. It's, it's temporary. And I see that person as a person rather than an object. And, and that I'm a big fan of that. When you see people as people and say, Hey, what are this person's needs, objectives, and challenges? Those three that our ranger talks about, what are their needs, objectives, and challenges? How can I, what can I do? How can I help them? Um, and first I need to be aware of those things. And then how can I help? Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's shift to executives now. Right. So let's just say if you're the president of the United States, you don't have gobs of home time. Right. Probably not. <laughs> or, or if you're a hard charger in grad school, realizing that you have a passion, talent and capability to head significant business, you may have to go to India for two years to set up a data center or you may, you know, like you're going to take these massive leaps First of all, is there conversations you should have about uh, with your uh, significant other at the front end? And second of all, as you're stepping into those, like, I mean, if you're a Fortune 500 CEO, it's not like you're just eating up the time. What would be some best practices for an executive in that place on navigating the family and relationship sphere? Yeah, when it comes to this area, you guys are familiar with Clayton Christensen. Oh, yeah, uh, I mean, big fan. Yeah, and I'm, we're singing the same tune when it comes. We to did that. a whole episode on him. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah, man. Yeah, that that, that yeah. He, he's one of my favorite in this realm of kind of family. You know, he's a, he's the family guy, but man, yeah, he's business. He does. He talks about yeah. You got to have that 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 balance, which is really tough if you are super busy, like ultra busy, and you're going everywhere. You got to find other ways to to meet the right three three needs, and that one connection is the one that's going to be really really tough. So you got to find ways. You got to have that conversation. Say, honey, is this? And then you got to be able to determine: Do I need to drop some things? You know, I once had a wise leader. He said, you know, there are balls. We're all juggling all these balls in the air. And he says, some balls are made of rubber and some balls are made of glass. And then he looked me in down the barrel wow. and he said, it's great. Don't drop the glass balls. I was like, boom, right. That was my drop for me. My family was glass ball. 
And it was, it was craziness, right? And I'm in Missouri, I'm writing grants, I'm getting like 20 million in grants and I'm traveling to do all this. And then it was like, Whoa, Dave, what are you doing? Yeah. What for? What's the why again? And I'd be like, Oh yeah, it's my family. And I would make excuses. Yeah. I'm working my, it's all for the family, for the family. And I'm like, no, nah, don't, yeah, don't cheat yourself out here. So they do, they have to have a conversation here and say, Hey, is this what we really want? And, because I'm going to be gone, or I'm going to be traveling, or maybe it's going to be a busy month. And then, hey, then we can take some time, we can take vacation. But it's about balance and being open to that other person because there's some real conversations that need to be had. If that partner, that spouse, or those kiddos are like, we can't do this anymore, it's like, okay, yeah, do I need to pump the brakes on this? Or, or something else is going to happen. Something's got to give because you can't have all those glass balls in the air. Some of it have to be made of rubber and will bounce back and be there when you get back. But family and relationships often will not. Yeah. yeah. So before you get married, if you're on that, you know, I am making a beeline. I'm going to get a Harvard MBA. I'm going to go work at Boston Consulting Group. And I'm just going to... Or, or let's take a look at marrying somebody who's in the medical profession right before they hit the residency, right? Where they're, you're basically married to a zombie for three years because they're not sleeping. Should you have those <laughs> conversations about what that looks like going in? I, I think it's important. I think it's important to have a realistic conversation about, yeah, what, and there are maybe, you know, when I was going through 10 years of grad school, it was hard and there were those nights and it was like, yeah, this is, this is not easy. And there were some times when, yeah, I have to, I'm not going to do this assignment because my marriage is more important. And in the, in the long run, I've got to save that. And so it's, it's some of this give and take, but yeah, Chris, I think having it's a conversation of yeah, medical school or this school, I'm going to plow through this. Is this what we want? Is this what we're, are we both on the same page? Are we both headed in the direct, in the same direction? Because if, if we're not, this might not work out. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, um, what else would you say to, uh, maybe to organizations that are trying to maintain a good culture, uh, maintain good relationships, uh, when everybody's working remotely? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one's a tricky one. It's, it, a lot of businesses were tested, I think, with the COVID of, of uh, staying away. And Zoom could only help, you know, so much. <laughs> and even the creativity. And you guys saw my little mask earlier that, that on our Zooms, the one way to kind of keep things like these fun. We had dress up, you know, Zooms. You've probably seen those where everyone dressed up in a costume and I dressed up in this costume. We, we had to make it light and still find ways to to connect, to still work together. Um, but I think even then for managers to be able to, to check in and at the personal level, not just say, Hey, Hey, Chris, or Hey, Hey, Ben, how's, how's that report coming? And, and, and how are things, but it's a really the personal level and they get to know those who get to know their personal lives as well and say, Oh man, how's Alice? How's the kids? And Hey, you guys able to, to get that vacation or man, how's, how's homeschooling going for you guys? Cause over here it's super rough. And so they're yeah. able to share and connect at a personal level. And then people are more open to your to your teaching and correction. So when I, I talk to leaders and, and families, even I talk about this positivity pyramid with happiness and flourishing at the bottom, and then the relationship is next, and then teaching, and then correction is up here at the top. Now, in order for um, a manager or anyone to give correction, if you don't like that person, think about it, guys. If, if someone you can't stand. They give you correction. They're like, oh, oh, Chris, sweetheart, honey, you, this is what you need to do here next time. <laughs> and you don't like that person, Chris. Them are fight words. Fight yeah. words. Fight words. Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> you can put on that fake little smile. And then as soon as that boss leaves, you roll your eyes and you jab the person next to it. You're like. You're fantasizing yeah, about you're some stupid. violent demise in the parking lot. You That's know? exactly what you're doing. I'm like, man, we're going to take this joke around. <laughs> it is. And so that's why, that's why flourishing happy person first, connection, direction, correction in that order. See, mm -hmm. are you listening, you guys? This is cor connection, direction, correction. You've got to yeah. find ways to connect before you direct and correct. Yeah. You know, I, I, I oftentimes talk with my MBA students and uh, with executives around um, performance management, around giving feedback. And uh, you just hit the nail on the head there in terms of, um, you know, if you're going to give someone negative feedback, and you should, if if they are doing something that they shouldn't be doing, or they need to do something differently, and you need to give some corrective feedback, um, it, it's much easier, and it's going to be much more readily accepted by that person if they, upon your giving that feedback, 
already know in the marrow of their bones that you deeply care about them as a person and that you value what they do. Otherwise, <laughs> it's it you know it, it's very likely that they're going to just become defensive and it's not going to do anything and it might even be counterproductive. Yeah, exactly. And you guys know this. I had a niece who recently lost a uh, a job and she left not because of the mm -hmm. the the environment or what she did and she loved the people she worked she left because of the man she you know just it right. just wasn't there it was toxic she felt and say i'm out of here i'm making good money but for me it's it's not worth it you see that a lot people bouncing around and leaving jobs not be, they leave bosses not jobs and it's it is you gotta have that and whatever investment that is of, of connection i'll even ask my kiddos you know tell me about your favorite teacher School just started, or they're, thankfully they're able to go to school. And I ask them, hey, tell me, and then they, and I ask them specifically, I say, hey, what, what makes a great teacher? You know, they say, oh, they're, they're funny, or yeah, they make, they, they're doing these things. So they're finding ways, the good ones, and the good bosses, the good parents, they're finding ways to, to connect, to make things light. Yeah, they're, they're fist bumping or elbow bumping, and they're doing engaging things for those kiddos. Because I can be the smartest professor or the like a brilliant boss and have this plan, but if I'm not able to connect with the employees at the personal level as a human being, forget about yeah. it. Yeah, it's not going to translate down. So you know that brings up another idea of you know what do you do with uh, the technical genius in an organization who at the same time is just an interpersonal train wreck? Yeah, or or here I want to be a little bit more empathetic. Um, it. People are on the spectrum sometimes, the autism spectrum, right? They they don't get those human factors. But anyway, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, yeah, th this one's tough, you guys, because often I think one of the, the keys is engage, helping them to engage with similar personalities, right? That they are. Some people are, yeah, I'll just stay in my cubicle, and I'm brilliant, and I this is my flow experience is doing this. And where maybe others are the ones that have the strengths in leading and discussing um, but being able to come together and I think every, well, most people, right, have some form of, uh, of what they like, of, of their style. And so it's getting used to that. It's not trying to change that person, right? I, I'm not a fan of, you know what, gosh, this is going to work. You, you got to be more like outgoing like me, you know, change them to, <laughs> to me. Adapt, adapt and use their strengths and say, hey, this is, this is their style. Of course, you have to have some expectations. You can't, you know, always be late for all the time or, hey, you didn't let me know again. You know, send me a text or email or things. So it's not just to gloss over the, the problems or the, the things that they need to work on. But you, you just can't change that personality of kind of what we're, what we're born with. But you can change some of the things um, that, they, that they do, maybe mm -hmm. uh, tweak things or maybe even been asking them, you know, we're kind of struggling in this area and we're not getting as much feedback or input from you just a one on one, not pointing them out, making them embarrassed. But, but you, you, you know, tell me what, what went well or what you could do better. The best coaches, again, example, my uh, soccer coach for my son, he pulls some kids out, but the first thing he says, all right, guys, what happened out there? And he has them instead of being like, you loser, you know, what are you doing? He asked them, <laughs> you know, what went well and what could you do better next time? Because most often people know, and if they don't ever say it, they say, yeah, and yeah, the, this report or this project or something, what can we do about it? And you have them come up instead of the, yeah, no one loves to be, to be reamed or to yell that from kids to athletes, to students to in the workplace, it, it doesn't go well. Yeah. Yeah. So let's uh, wrap up a little bit with a bit of recap. So today we talked about Dr. Dave Schramm's background and his passions <laughs> in this area, which I mean, if you can't feel the passion coming through the microphone, you're a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and we talked about marriage, the marriage and family help landscape, how some of it's just puffery and not evidence based. You guys need to plug into the evidence based stuff. Dr. Dave here, like, gave so many examples. Go back with a pen and pencil. Listen, write down these books. Like, I've read most of them. I got a couple I'm going to check out now because of this episode. And 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 Dave's assessment of, you know, kind of where quality is and where it's not. We also went through a litany of practical vignettes of advice on issues that impact individuals, families, organizations, and teams and how we can benefit from, because a lot of people don't go into, they go to the IO psych or management science information at best, but they actually don't go to this individual flourishing marriage and family. I mean, all of that, just because it's a dynamic from marriage and family, doesn't mean you won't see that dynamic in your workplace as you have close interrelated working teams. So 
Dr. Dave, again, thank you so much for being a guest, but what else would you like to share today? Like, where can people find you on the web? You know, those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, you bet. I, I put out all kinds of tips. So I take the research and I put out all kinds of tips on my on my Facebook. So Dr. Dave USU, that's Dr. Dave USU. That's where I, I do a lot of little bits. Just here's a, a Tuesday two minute tip, and I do a little video, and I'm putting out a new series of of Dr. Dave Thrive in Five on Thursdays, and so they can check things out there. They can go to Dr. Dave um, Speaks to, to check out other things that I'm that I'm doing and some of the training and consulting um, stuff that I do. So those are the those are the main places. Awesome. Well, Dave Schramm, thank you so much for being part of the Indigo Podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.